Hey everybody, thank you for joining me again. My name is Steve Lushan. I'm going to be doing another reaction video for you today. This particular one was sent to me by a guy named Sam. He lives in New Zealand. He was doing a deep wreck dive at night with his buddy at over 100 feet when he had a bail out of his KISS rebreather. Now, for those of you out there that don't know what it means to bail out, I'm gonna do my best to explain it to you. If, however, there are KISS rebreather instructors or divers that would like to use the comment section to explain it better, I do appreciate that. Also, during the review section of this video, you might catch something that I missed. So use the comments section. When we bail out of a rebreather, it could be because of a high PO2 or a low PO2. Either way, that could kill you. But it could also be because of hypercapnia. Hypercapnia is elevated levels of CO2 in our breathing loop. When this happens, it's a very uncomfortable feeling. You feel like you're suffocating. You start to hyperventilate. It's not fun at all. And when that happens, we have to bail out of our rebreather. I'm using what's called a DSV. When I bail out, I have to take it, turn off the loop like this and take it out of my mouth. And I put in my open circuit regulator, which is around my neck. And I start breathing off of that. I end my dive. What a lot of other rebreather divers are doing, I believe the KISS rebreathers as well, they use what's called a BOV, a bailout valve. Their gases, their open circuit gases or bailout gases are already plugged in. They turn a knob, they start breathing off of them. It's pretty cool. They end their dive. Now, if you haven't done so already, please like, subscribe, and hit that bell, but stay tuned because at the end of this reaction, I have a special guest. Sam is going to be joining us from New Zealand to explain exactly how he got through this dive. So you're not gonna to wanna to miss it. It's gonna be pretty crazy. All right, stay tuned. We're gonna get started right now. All right, so I see the cameraman gives the okay signal. This means okay. This means there's a problem. We're thumbing the dive, we're going up. This means we're going down. So they fast forward, obviously, 20, ah, everything's in meters. Good old metric. I lived in Canada for seven years. You'd think I would know that by now, but so we're at about 68, 69 feet. There's a lot of sediment in this wreck. I'm curious to see how old this particular shipwreck is. So that's our boy Sam in the white fins. He's the guy in the front there. He's the one you want to watch later on in this video. Wow, so they're over 100 feet deep inside of a wreck at night. What could go wrong? Oh, well, there's the first thing. The on and off slider catches on the door and turns off, but he didn't know. So this wreck has been sanitized. What that means is it's actually been kind of cleaned up for divers to make it safer, easier to get in and out of. But it looks like it's still, I mean, there's still lots of metal in there, lots of places to get lost or stuck. These guys have pretty good trim and buoyancy. I'm curious to know like how many dives each of them had during the filming of this. Oh, check it out. You see that little eel, like a little blue. Very cool. Stuff in New Zealand that we do not have here in the Great Lakes. Notice the temperature, and it's, we'll have to ask him what that is in, uh, in Fahrenheit. If that was Fahrenheit, yeah, we'd be in trouble. <laughs> 17 degrees. Notice his... Fin, his finning technique, very good. Cautious not to um, silt up the bottom. That's the problem with wrecks like this is you see where he was going in at, if he was just blowing up the bottom, all that silt would just black things out. It'd make it almost impossible to see your way. I do want to ask them why they weren't running a line. So apparently there's a stone, that stone right there, They everyone goes in the wreck and they clean that thing up. It's like some 
there's some ritualistic thing that they do. I'll have to ask Sam about that. This is the moment, guys. Okay, so this is where Sam gets dizzy. Ah, see what this means is I'm not feeling good. And his buddy seems to see that, but he turns his head and just starts diving the other way. It's like he didn't really care. I wonder if his buddy wasn't thinking that Sam was having an issue, but maybe it was where he was going or something else. I don't know. Because if that was me and that was my dive buddy, I'd be on top of him right, right there. So I think there may have been some misunderstanding. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. I'm sure that's what it was. Oh, bubbles. So if I'm diving with a rebreather diver and I see bubbles like that and I hear bubbles, I, I know right away there's a problem. Somebody is bailing out. There is a, there is a problem with that rebreather. Notice the bubbles, he says. Yeah, bubbles aren't really a good thing unless we're venting. On, um, I have what's called counter lungs, they do as well, and those fill up with air. What we need to do is we need to get rid of some of that if we want to, if we want to become less buoyant. If we find ourselves rising, you need to vent, and that's okay. But to see bubbles coming out of the BOV, what he's breathing from, that means he bailed out. There's a problem. So you see, he's starting to book it. So Sam is on his way back. And his buddy doesn't seem to really understand, like, why is, why is my buddy going so fast? Notice, too, there's some sediment that he kicked up, very little bit. But he's obviously not being as cautious now at this point. I mean, he just wants to leave. So there's an obvious problem here. I think his buddy's starting to pick up on it. Oh, there it is. So when we wave our light like that, that means that it is, there's a problem. Pay attention to me right now. And he thumbs the dive. So that means that, you know, he's saying, I'm done. I got to go up. And finally, he gets his, his buddy's attention. Good. And by the way, give it to the buddy now. Now that his buddy knows there's a problem, he's on top of him. You see the fins are right in front of his face. I mean, he's right there on top of him. He's just making sure that he's okay. I know this is a horrible time to say this, but look at the colors on that wreck. I'm sure Sam and his buddy weren't paying attention at this time to that. What a beautiful wreck. So he's asking his buddy to um, turn his overpressure relief valve or the OPV. I have the same thing. Mine's on my front, on my side. His is in his back, is on his back. And you want to release that. That way when you're coming up, you can vent easily and get those bubbles like that, that we were talking about out of the loop. Man, lots of bubbles. There's a problem. I mean, he's definitely bailed out here. He is on open circuit, essentially. And he's breathing off of these tiny little bottles, right? Now, this is smaller than what he's breathing. But can you imagine breathing off of little tiny bottle, bottles instead of your big tanks, like on open circuit? You only have a little bit of time on there compared to like an 80 cubic foot or 100 cubic foot of aluminum or steel. Yeah, I'd say you are in trouble there, Sam. But notice how calm he is for what he's going through right now. Very curious to his experience level at this point. Notice the bubbles coming out of the OPV on his back. And he's just grabbing stuff. You notice his, his change in the way he's diving now? His trim, he's not worrying about as much. He's kind of grabbing along, holding stuff, staying, staying calm, but just grabbing stuff. He's not as worried about, you know, touching the wreck. And I know why. I mean, at this point, he just, he's trying to survive. He's trying to make it out alive. I get it. See, I, I did wonder about that. So he forgot, looks like, to switch his computer, uh, his uh, controller, which is his one computer on, on a Nerd, or you can have it on a wrist mount. And you also have a backup on your other wrist. He forgot to switch it from closed circuit rebreather to open circuit. And you gotta do that because your computer doesn't know. And you notice his decompression obligation did in fact go up because of that. So now his computer knows that he's breathing on open circuit and he picks up his stage bottle. So a stage bottle is something similar to this, right? So this is like a stage bottle. This is a stage bottle. So we would take that bottle and we would hang it or we would stage it at the beginning of our wreck, or the, sorry, the beginning of our dive. And we would have it there because we wouldn't want to be bringing those clunky big tanks with us inside a, you know, a wreck with openings as small as what they had there. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. So they take and put it in right where they would be ascending. And that way, um, if and when they needed it, they can grab it. In this case, he needed it. And you can see he's, he's kind of 
making sure everything's on and ready to work. And it looks like he's getting ready to go up. His depth right now is 22 meters. And notice his deco obligation is for um, at nine meters for one minute. His buddy's telling him, kind of just hold on and relax. Just hold on and relax. He's letting him know, I'm here with you. I'm o you're okay. He's, they're looking at the computers right now. What's my deco obligation? He's checking it out. He's blowing his SMB. Give it to Sam, guys. I mean, he's not letting his buddy blow the SMB. He's blowing the SMB for himself. We do this for a couple reasons. The surface marker buoy lets the boat captain know where we are in case we get, you know, um, caught in a current or we get start drifting. But also, if there's an issue or a problem, um, it will let them know that, hey, we're coming up. So it also lets the diver have a reference point to be able to follow up instead if, he's, if he doesn't have a line to go up to the wreck. So this is something that he's doing for himself and his buddy. I mean, look how calm and collective he is. I mean, this guy is this close to dying, really. He could at any moment. I mean, something could, if one thing else goes wrong for him, I mean, it could be that. Trust me, I've seen people pass away on, on wrecks, and it's sad. It happens, it does. And I'm glad Sam's okay. I can't wait to interview him after this. So he still has some decompression obligations here. Yeah, those little tanks don't last forever. You know, he's, he's breathing those things down. I'd be curious at this point right now what his air was, what his pressure was in that tank, in his bailout tank. They're having a conversation here. You see they're kind of fast forwarding through it. So now he has one minute left of Deco at 20 feet. Honestly, if you if you weren't a rebreather diver or you weren't being told what was going on, you some people may have a hard time knowing like the seriousness of this. I mean this is bad. You have a decompression obligation. You have a not only a virtual ceiling, right, where you can't come up, but he had a physical ceiling because of that wreck that he was on. Now he's in open water, right? He, he's, he, he doesn't have that ceiling, but he has a virtual decompression ceiling, a virtual obligation that he cannot exceed. If he does, he's going to a chamber probably. He could get himself, get himself hurt or killed. So he knows he has to come up carefully and controlled, but at the same time, he's watching that air, watching it go down. And he knows I'm, I'm in trouble. He's trying to breathe calmly, but I'm sure his heart rate is up. So he's metabolizing that oxygen. He's having to breathe faster. I mean, this is down to the wire. Wow. So he runs out of that little bailout bottle that we were talking about. He finally runs out of it. And notice he's gonna switch to his open circuit regulator. That open circuit regulator, folks, it's, it's, it looks something like this. So he's switching to that now. You notice that bottle that he picked up? That's what he's switching to. That's what he's breathing. I'm not sure what that mix is. If it's like a 50% or an 80%, I'll have to ask him. But he makes it to the surface. He made it to the surface. Unbelievable. We got to give it to Sam, guys. And to his buddy. You know, I know in the beginning his buddy maybe didn't catch it right away, but when he knew there was a problem, he was on top of him. He was there with him. I'm sure that, that brought some peace to Sam so he knew that he wasn't alone. But listen, let's get Sam on here right now. I got some questions. I know you do too. Stay tuned. Hey, everybody. So we have Sam with us. Sam, I want to thank you for joining me today. Uh, before no we get started, I would like you just to briefly tell us about yourself. Yeah, no worries. Um... So yeah, I, I live in New Zealand, um, you know, way down in the bottom of the Southern Hemisphere. Um, I grew up as a kid um, around the water. I lived on the beach, um, spent most of my sort of younger years sailing and, and free diving. Um, and I kind of, uh, I got interested in scuba diving with my brother, um, my younger brother, actually went and got certified before I did. Um, and, and I had a bit, of a, um, a bit of a struggle with getting a medical certificate because I had childhood asthma. Um, so kind of gave up on the idea for a long time um, and then things progressed a bit in the in the diving medical world and, and you know people realized that asthma wasn't really a big deal as long as it doesn't affect the diving so I went through the whole treadmill test side of things to get 
um, to get certified from a medical perspective and then got my ticket in uh, 2011, I believe. Okay. Um, just patty open water. Uh, and and never I never had any intentions to do anything major with scuba diving. I was just interested in, you know, having a bit of a look around and grabbing the old crayfish here and there and that kind of thing. And like, like everything does, it spiraled out of control and, and uh, <laughs> one wreck dive later, I'm hooked on it and, uh, <laughs> and going down the technical, the technical path. So, yeah. Um, but in, in saying that, I'm still a, a very new diver. I've only got uh, 162 dives under my belt. So I've progressed quite quickly through to the technical side of things. Yes, you have. Um, you know, arguably a lot faster than most people would. Um, but it's it's sort of down to the type of diving that I'm interested in and the people that I hang around with. Um, they're all very experienced technical divers. So I sort of, you know, you tend to get dragged along that path. Yes. Um, yeah, so of, of those 50 of them are wreck dives, 29 on this thing, this the CCR. Um, qualifications wise, I'm, I'm a TDI uh, advanced night trucks and deco um, diver and a KISS air dill diver on the CCR. Um, and the, on the rec side of things, I've only done the paddy rec specialty. I haven't done any of the advanced rec training. It's definitely on the to-do list, but um, that's kind of limiting me at the moment. Um, yeah. So yeah, diving wise, that's, that's, that's me. Awesome, man. Thank you for that. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about this wreck. I'm watching this, right? And the colors on that wreck are just beautiful. It looks massive. It doesn't look <laughs> all it doesn't look all that old. I noticed there's a lot yeah. of sediment and stuff, but man, what a beautiful wreck. Tell us briefly about that wreck. Yeah, so the the, the Canterbury, it's it's a um it's an ex uh, New Zealand Navy frigate. Um, it's, a, it's called a Leander class frigate. Uh, it's, it's 113 meters or 372 feet long um, and got a beam of about 50 feet um, draft of 18. So it's a small Navy ship, um, but it's still a ship, you know, it's a fairly sizable yeah. wreck to be diving on. Uh, it, was, it was launched in 1970 and it was scuttled in 2007. So it is quite new. Um, and they did an amazing job of scuttling it. Like it's perfectly upright. It's almost perfectly level. It's intact. That's um, what I was noticing. Broken. Yeah, that's what we were noticing on it. It's amazing. So tell me yeah, about yeah. that stone. Um, I noticed there's like this weird round stone when you guys went in. <laughs> what, what room was it that you went into? Uh, so so that's, the, that's the engine room. But the engine room is actually broken into four parts. So there's the there's the top and bottom levels of the engine room. And then there's the boiler rooms in front of that. So we were in the top. Um, the top part of the engine room um, and that, yeah so that, that stone that I was sort of rubbing clean which I think is a bit of a contributor to what, what happened um, yeah. it's just a it's, it's so the, the local um, sort of indigenous people in New Zealand the Maori people they um, they're quite sort of connected they're, they're kind of like a guardian of the land here and, and um, in Northland there are two um, two hapu or two tribes and each of the tribes engraved a rock with a with a you know a, a significant engraving, and those stones have been placed on the wreck just as a um, a bit of a link back to the local people. So it's sort of yeah, the rocks become a bit of a you know it's just a bit of a thing. You swim past it, you give it a clean, so you can see the see the carving on it, and it's sort of just a um, yeah, it's, it's become a bit of a habit of the dives that we do. That's cool. Yeah, we have in the, the Great Lakes, we have rituals and things that we'll do on certain wrecks similar to that i just noticed you guys doing that it was cool um mm. so tell us this sam when did this incident occur how long ago was this um so it, i think it was may last year it was on a a, a liverboard trip that we did um up in the bay of islands so yeah it wasn't wasn't long ago um, and how, really fresh how many dives did you and your buddy have during the filming of this um so i I had, um, I actually think I wrote this down somewhere. I had, uh, that was my 153rd dive. Oh, wow. Um, it was my 25th on that particular wreck. And that that exact dive that we did in that video, I've done many times before. Um, so it was sort of just a, it was a, it was actually at night. You know, we thought we'd do this, we'd do a dive that we were comfortable with at night and see, see how different it was. I asked that because one thing that I noticed the way you handled this situation, and we're going to get to that. I have some questions about the incident itself. <laughs> the way you handled that situation, honestly, it was like a seasoned veteran CCR diver or instructor. I'm, I'm being honest because 
Mm. The way you handled it seemed to be very calm, cool, collective. I could tell that you that there was some serious issues going on. Just the look in your eyes in some of the points of the of the video, I can tell like it's you were you were uh, in serious trouble, but you didn't bolt, you didn't freak out, you didn't, you know. I mean, you it's like you remembered your training, and you did yeah. what you should have done. I mean, I, I that was pretty awesome. So, um, yeah, that's why I talk about that. I mean, even your trim and buoyancy. I know your trim got a little bit weird in some spots, but. Who cares? I mean, you were saving your life at that point. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to just tell you, I mean, it, I thought you had a lot more dives under your belt. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, I, I try to, um, I'm quite a technical and analytical kind of person. So, and especially with technical diving, but, you know, I, I, I watched a lot of people around me and pick up on a lot of things. And I, I try to self-educate myself quite a bit. So you know, I do, I do a lot of reading and I watch a lot of videos on YouTube. So I've sort of inadvertently managed to learn a lot of things that are probably a little bit beyond my experience. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I've, I've taken diving fairly seriously to the point where I've tried to understand why things like trim and buoyancy are really important, particularly in wrecks. Yeah. Um, you know, they're kind of, that, that wrecks, we, we like to call that a training wreck because you can actually get in there and kick the crap out of it. And it's, it's quite thick. Um, it was quite heavy sediment, so it okay. settles relatively fast. I was going to ask you about um, that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it is quite a forgiving wreck. Um, but in saying that, you know, it's still important to use it as a training ground for some of the biggest stuff that I intend on doing down the line. So right along that line, here's a question that I know people are going to have. I had. Why wouldn't you run a, a line through that? Uh, <laughs> It's a night dive. It's a there's an overhead environment. Obviously, I mean the compartments and the different spots in that ship. Ship it's pretty big. So explain maybe a little bit about that. I know in your video it says that the ship was sanitized. The wreck was sanitized. Maybe explain that a little bit, and for our viewers so they understand yeah. what that means and why you didn't run that line. Yeah. So that line in that wreck has actually been a hotly debated topic. Um, but yeah. So the wreck itself was was. Uh, um, purchased as a floating wreck um, by a trust for a dollar, I believe. <laughs> and um, and the, the full intention was to sink it as a wreck, right? So they went through and they pulled out all of the cabling, all of the, you know, all of the lagging on the walls, anything that could deteriorate and fall down and become an entanglement has it got ripped out. Um, and then they also cut holes in the ship all over the place. So you're really never more than one 90 degree corner away from an exit. So it's it's um it actually arguably becomes more dangerous to run line in that wreck because you're just creating entanglement hazards okay. and and that combined with the fact that the sediment is um is quite heavy and it settles quickly it's sort of it's a balance right between what's safer and what isn't okay um i i i 100 agree that being that that was a night dive we probably should have reconsidered that because um, you know, you can lose all visibility by losing light, not just yeah. sediment. True. Um, we, we, we carry, you know, multiple backup lights. So I've got, um, I think I carry four or five, um, <laughs> you know, when you're doing <laughs> I do too. <laughs> so I sort of, and, and your buddy's got the same, you know, so yeah. we've got all of 10 lights in that wreck at one time. It's sort of very unlikely that you're going to run out of light. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, it's, there's actually, so there's a, there's a book I've got here, which is called a guide to the Canterbury wreck. Um, and it was written by uh, one of the ex-engineers that worked on the wreck as a Navy officer. And he's a technical diver. His name's Steve Davis. He's actually the host of Speaking Side Melt. Okay, yeah. Have you heard that? I have. Um, that book is amazing. And, and he's got a whole section in that book that talks about running line in it, um, whether or not to. So it's sort of, even by the seasoned pros, it's a it's a sort of a, you know, one way or the other. But um, good yeah, on, on the top, on the upper levels where the sediment isn't too bad, um, we choose not to run line. If we're running, if we're going deeper into the ship below the waterline where there isn't as many holes, then we we probably would. Um, albeit I haven't been that deep inside the wreck because that's sort of taken the piss a bit out of my training. Um, okay. So I haven't I haven't done that yet. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you for that answer. That's good. I, I know that that that'll help some people because people will have that question, I'm sure. So what do you think caused your dizzy spell? So I, I see that in the video. I mean, did it come on quick? Was it something that 
happen slowly? What do you think caused that? If you if you had to guess, or do you know for sure? I, yeah, so we um, we've sat down over many a beers after the after this dive and tried to figure that out. I, um, I did. I mean, so going through the possibilities, right? The sorb that was in the rebreather had about half an hour on it, so it was fresh. Mm -hmm. um, this thing's got two rebreather cans. Yeah. So the likelihood of having a channel that the you know that the the loop volume can pass by is very low because you'd have to have a channel in both scrubber canisters. Okay. Um, so I don't think it was a channel. Uh, there's a possibility it was just a head brush. So you know, like if you put your head down really quickly and then bring it back up again, you can. Okay. Sometimes get a bit dizzy. Um, I think that'd be less likely underwater though because you know the effects of gravity aren't quite as strong. Um, so the only thing that I can really put it down to is probably shallow breathing. Um, okay. Obviously, in a rebreather, you have to exchange the gas you do. in and out of your lungs for it to scrub the CO2 out. I'd um, like to say this too. It, it, anyone watching this, um, rebreathers, KISS rebreather instructors, uh, anybody, if you have any ideas, if you've experienced something like this similar, please comment below. We'd like to hear about it. If you have yeah, any yeah, I'd be really yeah. interested. Yeah. If, you have, if they have any questions, I mean, comment below too. I'll, we'll do our best to ask, uh, to answer them. So, mm. well, okay, that makes sense. Now, yeah, so I think that's all it could really be is I was so relaxed on that dive that I just wasn't really breathing. Um, and, and you know, it, it could just be that all I was doing was exchanging the, the air in and out of, out of your, you know, your esophagus and not actually passing it through the loop. Wow. Okay, mm. so now with that being said, right in the beginning when it looks like things are starting to go a little south, right? You, you say that you're on and off switch could you explain what is that first of all yeah um, I, I couldn't find it i tried to find it but so this on, on this rebreather, i don't know if you can see it this is the this is the line that basically plugs into your off board yes um and just just next to that it had a slider on it right you quite often see them on the oxygen feed of um of kiss rebreathers okay. and i think that's actually where they're supposed to be um but it just allows you to basically slide a slider and turn it off okay now, did that contribute yeah. to any of the anything um, and how? Well, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't see that it would. So um, during the dive, everything was working. I know that it was on, right? Because I have I use my bailout valve um, to add diluent into the loop as I'm descending. Yes. So I know it was working for the first half of the dive because otherwise I would have tried to add loop volume and it wouldn't have worked, mm -hmm. right? So because that slider had turned off, right, that had basically shut down my my bailout tank to the mouthpiece yeah um so i got i got dizzy i jumped off well actually the first thing i did was okay i'm i knew that i was going to get off the loop so the first thing i did was i wanted to i wanted to get rid of the loop volume right so i took a big deep breath in to get all of the volume out of the out of the counter lungs and cracked my bailout valve and then breathed it all out as bubbles so there was nothing in yeah. the rebreather right and then when I went to take a breath, there was nothing. The rig didn't work. There was no, there was nothing, nothing oh, here at all. So see, that's something I missed in the video. Holy crap. Yeah, yeah. So that was the, I mean, that was the real problem is when I cracked the, to the bailout valve expecting to take a nice breath of open circuit air, there was nothing. Holy so God. I kind of, for some reason, my mind went to um, why, they, so I just thought, the only thing that must have caused that is that the tanks, the, my bailout regulator that's sitting on the tank must have been free-flowing the whole dive and emptied the tank. Yeah. So, I, 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 I mean, the training says that if there's nothing in your bailout valve, grab your regulator, put it in your mouth and take breath, right? I didn't do that because for some weird reason, I'd already made the decision that that tank was empty. And, and because I breathed out, um, you know, you can hold your breath for quite a while if you breathe in, right? But breathe out and try and hold your breath. <laughs> it's you, know, you, you, get, you get that urge to breathe really quickly. Yeah. Um, and so so that didn't work. The next thing I, I thought was, shit, where's, where's my buddy? He had, he had kind of like turned and swam about two kicks, right? Yes. And I just bolted at him. But he was swimming at the same speed I was, so I couldn't catch him. Um, and I got to the point where I just needed to breathe. And the only thing I could think to do was to go back on the loop. So I went back on the loop and then realized that I'd just breathed it all out. So there was nothing there either. Oh my God. So I'm sort of, I'm sort of at this stage getting, you know, 
convulsions, if you like, like my body is trying to force me to breathe. Um, and the only thing I could think to do was to pump it full of oxygen to get a, enough volume in the loop to breathe. Oh, man. So, so I did that. I, I filled it full of O2. And, you know, anybody that knows anything about diving will know that O2 at 32 meters is pretty damn bad. Yeah, that's <laughs> um, not good at all. So I, I kind of went from, all right, I've now had a breath, but now I'm breathing something poisonous. So I'm still not in a good space. Um, but it gave me enough time to think, you know, what the hell is going on? So I, at that stage, I reached down and grabbed the regulator on my bailout tank and pressed the purge button and it purged. So I was like, huh, it's not empty. How can that be? And, and my mind just started going, what's the difference between this and that? And the only, and I thought about that slider. So I reached yeah. down the line to the, to the thing and, and literally went click and ah. then cracked the ballot valve and went, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> so Man. I got a breath, but I mean, you can see in the video that all happened in, I don't know, five, 10 seconds, maybe. <laughs> That's so amazing. it wasn't, well, maybe, yeah, it might have been half a minute, something like that. But it, it, we noticed your dive buddy. He just didn't seem very concerned. And it, it threw yeah. me for a loop because <laughs> I see him looking at you. I see you say, ah, not feeling so hot. And he turns his head and kind of moseys along. And it took a little while for him to understand the severity of it. What was going on in his head? I'm sure you guys talked about it. Yeah, that. so we've, we've had a good chat about it afterwards. And he... um and, and I can understand from his perspective. So I was swimming in front of him, leading the dive. I sort of stopped, hung there for a little bit, very slowly turned around to look at him and gave him the kind of, you know, something's not right signal. He just, he just because I was so relaxed, he just thought, oh, the, the route's blocked. Wow. You know, we can't go that way. So turn around and we'll go the other way. So he, so he turned around and just slowly started swimming out the way so I could swim past him. Man. Um, completely un, unbeknown to him, that was about the second that he turned around was when I had a bit of a, a moment. <laughs> so we saw you and in my reaction, I, I mean, you, it was so plain as day. He's looking at you and then you're doing the light, you know, not okay, got a problem. And I see you thumb the dive and you could see yeah. that. He, now I, this is where I gave to him. I was really, I was really happy to see he got on top of you. He swarmed you at that moment. Oh, yeah. He yeah. knew that you were in trouble and that's what a good dive buddy needs to do, especially when someone is on a rebreather, because everything, anything can go wrong at that point where it's just a cascade of issues. And you could have, I mean, you could have died. I mean, that was, it was serious what you were mm. going through. So I, I was happy to see him get, you know, get close to you at that time. Yeah. I mean, he, he did a really good, and he is an amazing buddy. He's, he's quite a bit more experienced than I am. Um, so, you know, I lean on that quite a bit, but he, um, you know, it's the second that he knew something was wrong. He was, he was within an arm's reach with a rig in his hand, ready to go. Yeah. So I've got to give it to him. He did a, he did a bloody good oh. job as soon as he knew that there was something wrong. And I probably could have made more of an effort to make him aware of the fact that something was wrong. So you, did you think that he was more aware, obviously, because I saw you kind of booking it to where it, well, you weren't really booking it. You were, you were moving faster than you were earlier, but you were still pretty controlled but you were yeah. started to exit. Is that correct? When After you bailed yeah, out. Yeah, so, you so out. as soon as I sorted the problem and I had something to breathe, you know, my, my level of anxiety instantly got a little bit better. <laughs> I but, I, but I'm sort of like, I was, you know, by that stage, all my redundancy has gone, right? Yeah. So I'm thinking I want to get out of here and get to the surface as quickly as possible because other things can go wrong as well. You're breathing um, off of a small, smaller bottle. And yeah, at, at depth as well. So I'm chewing through it, yeah. We're, we're, you were at about 105 feet or so, over 100 feet, correct, at some points? Yeah, yeah, I think so. It's about 30, 32 meters, mm -hmm. something like that. Yep. Um, so, yeah, it's, you know, you're, you're chewing through your gas three times faster than you would, you know, at the surface. So nice. it's, and, and, and a, and a um, you know, what's a 40 cubic foot tank's not going to last very long down there. No, um, that, so you get to your stage bottle. We noticed yeah. that. Ex explain to people what that stage bottle was there for and why you left it um, at that specific spot. Yeah, so we, like, like any, you know, anyone should, we plan the dives before we do them. And we, we figure out where we want to go and we figure out, um, you know, how much, how much bailout gas we need at the worst possible time, which was basically where that happened. You know, it was the longest, deepest part of the dive. Um, and we, we worked out that we did have enough bailout just in, in um, 
you know, two, two 40 cubic foot cylinders between us, if something went wrong, we could get one of us to the surface very easily, okay. um, almost get both of us to the surface. But, you know, it's, it's easy to chuck another tank down there. And I just like to have a bit of insurance. So um, every dive that we do, where we know we're going to be going into decompression on that boat, we just drop a, you know, a full 80 cubic foot cylinder of air yeah. at the bottom of the downline, um, just as a, as a bit of a backup. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, like, you know, when I, so when I was coming out of the wreck, that's the first thing I was looking for. I was just, I was just like, look, as soon as I get that bottle, I'm happy. <laughs> so what was the mix in that, in that bottle? Was that a 50%, 80%? What was no, it's just, it's just air. Um, it was just air. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We, we could have, we could have taken, um, we could have taken a 50% mix, but we're only doing, you know, the decos, you know, it's only five minutes or 10 minutes of, if nothing goes wrong. And when something goes wrong, I think the worst case on that, we had something like 10 minutes of deco to do. Yeah. So it's so not when, a... when did you run out of your Dillywind bottle? Um, cause I <laughs> saw that, I saw you switch to your open circuit. Yeah, it was about 60. I literally switched and my computer cleared. So I was at three meters. Um, and <laughs> you know, so about 60 seconds. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so I could have made it. I could have made it to the surface on that on that cylinder. Yeah, because uh, and we see the video sped up. Um, it was fast forwarded just for sake of time. I know, but you, you could see you switch to there, and then next thing we know, at least, I mean, you're on the surface and we can see the boat. I know my heart felt yeah. a lot better when when I saw <laughs> you come up on the surface. I'm like, okay, he's okay. Yeah, but yeah. I, I mean, we still I still have my buddies, you know, forty cubic foot there as well. So yeah, uh, even if say. I didn't have that stage cylinder, we were fine. When you were when you were deploying your SMB, kind of backing up again, that was pretty awesome to, to watch how calm and cool and collective you were. Because, I mean, mm. your buddy wasn't wasn't doing it for you. Um, you know, you were doing everything yourself, which was amazing with the situation yeah. that was happening. And of course, I explain in my reaction video why we use an SMB, the multiple reasons. But yeah, I just gotta gotta tell you, man, that was that was pretty awesome watching you do that and then coming up just so, ever so slowly and stopping where you yeah, yeah. stop. <laughs> well, the, the the thing I was most paranoid about was my buoyancy at three meters. You know, like um, on a, on a broken rebreather, your trim goes to shit. Like yeah. they, and and that's that's sort of something you probably notice is I think my trim was relatively in control for most of the dive. As soon as I was off the loop, um, you know, it just. It, it, it was actually weird how how kind of for some reason i went feet down a lot really um yeah and it's just because the loop was empty you know like i sucked it dry and emptied it so it, it wasn't helping you know i was weighted all wrong for a, for an empty loop basically wow um but yeah the, the smb side of things the only reason i shot that like there is actually an upline with a buoy on it you know the boat was um well the boat was actually on a different one but the you know it's big enough to hold a boat so I could have just come up the line, but um, I just wanted to be sort of self-sufficient on on deco. So if I lost the line or whatever, I had an SMB there. Yeah, um, makes sense. You did a wonderful job on that. I mean, what? Yeah. So if I had to just ask you, what were your takeaways? Real brief, but what were your takeaways with with this whole thing? What did you learn, and how did this affect you going forward? Um, yeah. So I think the key thing is 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 to remember your training and just follow it like you know that you're, you're taught you're taught to do things in a certain order for a reason so if something goes wrong you know don't try and think yourself out of it just do it <laughs> um that, that'd be the first learning the second learning probably was a you know a conversation between me and me and my buddy and we've kind of agreed now that if anybody ever gives a not okay signal we're we're locking eyes until somebody gives the okay that's awesome um, you know so that you actually figure out what the problem is you know everyone agrees it and gives each other the okay before you you know you're parting ways because again if that happened if, and he was right in front of me looking at me with a rig in his hand he would have gone i would have gone no 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 out of here and he would have given me a rig yeah and that would have been that that's awesome man well tell yeah. you what i mean thanks again for coming on here and i'm just glad you're okay i'm glad you learned from it i mean i know <laughs> we all did just from watching this so uh, yeah I just I, again thank you for taking the time to do this and doing this and sending me the video i appreciate it no no that's a good thanks for i mean I, I i reached out initially i guess because i saw the the clip of, of your um your incident and and i think slightly you know, less having... uh slightly less calm at, you know <laughs> <laughs> but 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 probably arguably a bigger problem <laughs> yeah it was pretty pretty rough <laughs> yeah yeah but i mean i think the key is that yeah people need to talk about this kind of stuff because it is 
you know, I've learned most of what I know off other people. And, and if they didn't share some of their, you know, mishaps and learnings and stuff, then, um, you know, I wouldn't be where I, where I am today. And I think people, people in the dive community, it sort of it got a bit toxic for a while where, you know, rather than taking incidents as a learning opportunity, they became excuses for people to just abuse each other. So I think it's, it's good to talk about stuff ups and own them and, you know, try to move forward. And Sam, again, thank you for coming on, man. Uh, I'll try to have you on again. No we'll, have, we'll do another, maybe a reaction together or something. So yeah, I guess, yeah, hey, buddy, that sounds good. I look forward to it. Who knows? Maybe one day we'll get in the water. Uh, I'll come out your way. You don't need to come out here and dive in our cold Great Lakes. I want to see. Uh, I want to see where you dive. That looks beautiful. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's probably not much different temperature it was. <laughs> it's, it's pretty oh, cold. <laughs> yeah, I thought yeah. it was like seventeen degrees. Was it? 17? Oh, that so up, up, yeah, up where that wreck is. That's nice and warm. That you know that gets up into into the twenty degree Celsius range. But where I live in Wellington. You know, we're, we're, we're in single digits a lot of the time. Eight degrees is kind of normal. <laughs> For us, of course, it's in Fahrenheit. It, and, you know, we're in 37, 42 degree bottom temperature Fahrenheit. So you do the math. Oh, yeah, that's it. cold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't bought a heated undergarment yet, but I'm, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, I need to get one of those still. But I, I do appreciate it coming on. You have a great night and uh, we'll talk soon, okay? Yeah, you too. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Bye.